So, welcome back to the second part. Um, in the last part, we talked a lot about Eurocentric knowledge in which, and uh, Eurocentric city of the university and uh, other knowledge systems and the way they should maybe exchange. Uh, in this part, I will talk more about the student movement we had in Amsterdam to decolonize the university and how we got into tension with diversity and inclusion discourse in comparison to uh, decolonization. Uh, so five years ago, I was part of a student protest which started in the headquarters of the university board uh, here in Amsterdam. We had a two month op occupation. We broke a historical record, it was the longest student occupation of that uh, university board building. And what you saw at the beginning at the student movement, it was very white. Um, so, and also the demands uh, didn't really relate anything, had nothing to do actually with decolonization. Um, and at the time there was a lot of dissatisfaction with students and teachers around the neoliberal policy of the university. So you could think of budget cuts, uh, uh, and a lot of work pressure, flex contracts, uh, so things like this. And uh, yeah, not enough democracy or uh, say of teachers in comparison to the managerial board. Uh, so there was a lot of dissatisfaction growing, which had to do a lot to do with the neoliberal university. The quality of uh, research was, uh, it was more about quantity. Uh, yeah, a lot of asked of teachers to produce a lot of papers. Uh, and, and yeah, so th this all gave rise to this student protest. And then um, because it was so white, um, it was funny, uh, the one who, star who sparked basically the students of color to start organizing were two community members of the Afro-Caribbean uh, Dutch community who basically, yeah, observed this movement and thought like, hey, something, a voice is missing in this student occupation. And they organized a workshop around diversity, basically, and within it came a group. Um, and they thought of, okay, uh, we should start a university of color, uh, a group of yeah university students and teachers uh, of color who should demand uh, yeah a, a different direction of the movement uh, and formulate demands from there. And what you could see is this student movement. If you look at the demands of the two student groups, that what they were asking you could see, well, hey, the ones were around uh, the neoliberal university, so you had uh, too much top-down policy, money being wasted on speculations, uh, too centralized, well, uh, quantity over quality, these things. So basically the core goal of them was to safeguard the quality of the university education uh, and research and science. And for us, at the other hand, it was not about the quality, uh, because we were talking about, hey, this is a colonial institution, there's exclusionary mechanisms towards all kinds of different groups, there's exploitation of the global now, south and nature. So we were more talking about, our core goal was, okay, what's an ethical university? So what is the content produced? What is the purpose of the knowledge that's being made? Who is it serving? Um, so these are the yeah two sort of different strands in this movement, you could say. And then we had to occupy within the occupation a room. It was an occupation in occupation. Sometimes people said because we were then starting to ask and demand solidarity from the white students as well to support these claims. So because theirs were more on democratization, we said, okay, there can be no democratization without decolonization. Otherwise, it's only a democracy for the happy few, so to speak. Uh, so this is the... Yeah, the banner then we dropped there and we started to do all kinds of actions. And it was interesting also the the students' actions were all over the media all the time. Every day there was published in every media during the occupation, things about what's wrong with education, what should be better than everything. Uh, but we, as uh, students of color and the issue of racism, this was five years ago, we were completely ignored by Dutch media. So no, uh, no media platform wanted to... Uh, yeah, to, to give our story visibility. And what was funny, so uh, I had, for instance, uh, um, a journalist uh, calling me uh, up like, okay, where's the student protest going? Well, can you tell us? And as soon as I started to talk about racism or the University of Color that I was part of, uh, they would start saying, no, but what about the other student movement and the other issues? They would literally say, we are not interested in this. Uh, and we could see this also. I can give many examples, but the idea is we weren't platformed 
at any point. Um, and uh, this didn't discourage us to continue organizing, of course. So we organized a lot of lectures, started to do things with different communities in the city who approached us to do commemorations with speeches, with demonstrations, with campaigns, with uh, so so we had a lot of yeah input from outside the university actually of uh, different communities of color in, in the city uh, and at some point we started our own education platform uh, which was called the decolonial school at the time doesn't exist now but it was a three-month program with every week uh, food lectures music things like this um, and what we started to formulate with these demands was also for the university to be restructured and a commission came out of this uh, for which we could form our own research team and uh yeah pick the uh i say the researchers uh in in collaboration with other parties uh yeah it was a big complex process um but it's not for today maybe you can ask me in the q a how this all went to get there because it wasn't easy um but the important point is that um there was already a diversity and inclusion discourse around that time uh, at the university but we really wanted to go for decolonization which was different for us because if you look at the ethics of the institution we really wanted to go uh, yeah for the social justice aspect as uh, the video also shows of angela davis and uh, what you could see is every time we would mention the word decolonization or formal documents and everything that's brought upon a lot of resistance from different groups at the university so for instance we couldn't mention decolonization in the title of the commission it had to be a diversity commission not a decolonization commission and everything like this um so yeah that, it was basically uh, said like hey we uh, you have first have to prove that it's a colonial institution things like this uh, it was really difficult for people to grasp that we're actually inside a colonial institution um yeah because it's not talked about or conceptualized in that way especially and also um yeah a lot of uh, times it was said hey we do agree with you we should uh, decolonize things but uh, we don't, don't want to uh, step on anybody's toes and otherwise we don't get things done so there was also this kind of things happening in arguments uh, and you could sell, see also this uh, yeah at oxford university you see students putting things that are being silenced they say don't diversify decolonize saying hey we we don't want to just be included we really want to look at the ethics of the institution and of them being silenced and experiencing uh, this as well that it's very difficult to to um, look at the core of what the university is as a critique from the inside and yeah you could see this later as well uh, which is really funny um, these are four pictures of the diversity officers at Dutch University so these are the chief diversity officers at the University of Leiden the uh, Vrije Universiteit for University uh, University of Rotterdam and Amsterdam these are all white women um, and basically yeah it's ironic i mean a lot of these efforts went by people of color but then the paid and highest positions are basically white women on the topics of diversity and that you see also yeah gender comes first and then color and in, and not intersectional gender but white women first in terms of diversity uh, and there you can see also if it go comes to the language you see they don't speak the same language uh, of social justice of these movements but more of uh, okay it's also beneficial for the university yeah? you have less dropouts things like this or uh, uh, yeah it's better for the quality because if you have a diverse team you get better quality research so a lot a lot of the language to support diversity is a bit more focused on what are the benefits it benefits us all diversity but it doesn't go to the core of the ethical questions of what is the university producing for who and why was it built etc so these these difficult questions are usually not asked um, yeah uh, by the diversity discourses um, yeah i think uh, angela davis says it really nice right it seems that the term diversity has colonized all of our struggles for social justice when you only do the visible dimension of diversity you might end up with a group that is more conservative than the white people you try to diversify until we combine diversity with social justice we end up with diversity that makes no difference at all so really it's about the content and the ethics not just 
putting people in the same positions and keeping things the same. Uh, which may be a nice term also is, uh, if you would like to read that, it's from Filomena Asset around cultural cloning. And cultural cloning, in other words, is, okay, you put in diverse peoples in places, but they have to behave, act, and dress uh, like the people before them, like the white people. So basically it's a sort of, yeah, cultural cloning. So diversity without change. Um, yeah, and I think the difference is, uh, I, I think uh, I, at one of the optional readings, I also put a keynote delivered by Nathaniel Tobos uh, that was titled, Diversity is a Dirty Word. And there he, uh, uh, for instance, says about diversity, it lacks focus because it is too broad. Talk of diversity suggests that we are interested in, embrace, in embracing all differences, but we are not for we are not interested in welcoming rapists and racists into the classroom. Or uh, James Baldwin, I also like this quote, who once said, we can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity and right to exist. So basically these quotes very clearly show we're not here for diversity, everything is fine. It's also about the social justice aspect. And if your knowledge is dehumanizing or, or facilitating oppression, then this is not uh, ethical knowledge. So ethics is very important. Um, and also at the decolonial course, they also said that, you know, a university is put also a lot on, uh, right, technological, you have huge beta faculties uh, making sign that we went with the rocket to the moon. Uh, we have, we are developing bombs, we're developing technology that maybe uh, can improve oil refineries for Shell, things like this. So also the question is, hey, what kind of I mean, these technological advancements, advancements also have their price. And, and, and are we thinking of it? Because you can have an advanced or civilized society, but their ethics can be totally wrong, right? Um, so it says nothing about the ethics, how technologically advanced uh, uh, things you produce at the university. Um, and this is also a nice critique on diversity. Uh, written if you look for this article diversity is a white word uh, you can just google it and there was a piece from this uh, article that was uh, saying the following uh, diversity is a white word or as uh, I don't know how to pronounce the name Hassan Hash describes a white concept it seeks to make sense through the white lens of difference by creating curating and demanding palatable definition of diversity but only in relation to what this means in terms of whiteness. Terms such as diversity, multiculturalism, and culturally and linguistically diverse only normalize whiteness as the example of what it means to be and exist in the world. Therefore, the diversity discourse within the cultural sector has only created frames by which diversity is given permission to exist under conditional inclusion. Uh, basically saying, yeah, right, we already live in a pluriverse diverse world and Basically, you don't change the norm. You just give people a diverse corner somewhere, but the norm and the framework stays the same. Um, and I think maybe uh, another nice way to put it basically is we don't need a seat at the table, at the, let's say, a white-centric table. We need many different tables and seats to be able to sit on and to be able to, on an equal level, uh, to be valued. Uh, yeah, instead of being forced to sit at the white table. And I think basically, if you look at diversity and decolonization, diversity now is very normal, no, very normal. It's now uh, accepted, let me put it that way. It's accepted to talk about it now in the Netherlands, you for instance, have the code of diversity, code for diversity, every cultural institution has to have diversity policy. The, the, the corporations are taking it in because they know they need a diverse labor force. If they have to work internationally, they need to be able to work with cultural diversity. So basically the, the diversity uh, gives quality and things like this is now not controversial anymore. So it has its benefits. Um, and there's a lot of people with yeah good intent and, and uh, wanting to improve the world to work on diversity. Uh, and I think a quote of Noam Chomsky is really nice that says the smart way to keep people passive and obedient is to strictly limit the spectrum of acceptable opinion, but allow very lively debate within that spectrum. And what you see 
from my experience as a student organizer as well, as well at the university is that you have a very live and big spectrum of debate of diversity and inclusion of being included in the system uh, but not critiquing the system as such that uh, there is the let's say the border of that spectrum of uh, allowed debate and i think this is also what the article that you were reading about decolonization is not a metaphor was trying to speak about this we we are talking a lot about decolonizing the mind uh, decolonizing education systems but not actual decolonizing not actual giving back stolen lead not actual uh, yeah uh, giving up power basically uh, so in that sense uh, the range of debate is still quite limited and often still within the state framework um, yeah human rights framework of within the colonial system uh, but yeah, you see a lot of efforts uh, around the world of changing symbols, taking down statues, the roads must fall. Uh, so yeah, there's a battle for narratives going on definitely at many university campuses uh, today. And I think um, to give an example of a university uh movement in uh, latin america which is really interesting uh you have different universe uh universidad la tierra so universities of the earth if you would translate it freely uh you have multiple ones and there's one in uh, Oaxaca. i don't know how to pronounce it um and uh yeah it says on the website that uh, the universidad de la tierra or unitierra was uh, born amongst the context of radical reactions against schooling observed in many indigenous communities. We call ourselves a university to claim back the old tradition of first universities. That of learning together with friends around the table for the sole pleasure of learning and for the passion that studies, studying inspires. Our university is not for forgetting, forgetting a diploma or climbing the educational pyramid. We welcome young people with and without diplomas, some of who have formal degrees while others never went to school. Um, so yeah, they say explicitly that they want to not, you know, put hierarchies on who is the knowledge or di on diplomas, but it's just about your own development. They really put emphasis on the individual uh, for their own personal path. So it's not a central, okay, the teacher is the master of knowledge and you are the subject who we put knowledge in. It's more of a dialogue and trying to learn together from what people want and need to learn. Uh, this is not requiring any uh, diploma and also in uh, for instance in zapatista areas in mexico they even uh, forbade in some areas uh, for uh, government teachers to come and teach there and because they say they are destroying the knowledge of yeah indigenous peoples uh, and this was also yeah these university systems were made there as the response to the colonial way of teaching and knowledge that was basically destroying and inferiorizing other knowledges and you could see in the ethics of this university uh, so uh, western as western universities do not have these let's say ethics foundations uh, they do have it really strong in their university la tierra uh, so they say we fight for freedom to learn in different contexts so uh, the pluriversal context you can learn in different places with different people etc to eat uh, they say in alliance with communities and other organizations we struggle for claiming back our autonomy our gastronomy and passion for food as well as the struggle for the defense of the land water and territory so at this university explicitly they say they want to revive indigenous ways of knowledge of producing food relating to the land uh, yeah and their struggle for defense of land and territory so they have uh, an ethic purpose for the university set up to defend the rights and land um and then to inhabit we fight to recover a contemporary art of living responsible for taking care of life and the environment which we live so not only taking care of the people but also taking care of the environment having a relationship with the environment is a basis for this university to exist on and to talk we we fight to recover the word and to interweave it into countryside and the city so basically yeah, you have the, this university with its own ethical values uh, underpinning its culture and i think uh the hope then of course is that we can decolonize the university and transform it into something else and i think uh, this nice butterfly uh it's a symbol also in native american culture for transformation so who knows you know we can transform 
the university in something uh, something else. And I think the book, Decolonizing Methodologies from Lindsay to I, by Smith is a nice recommendation. Just talked about how can you give shape to research that is not colonial and extracting from communities, but working with them. How can you formulate research questions that are really helpful to communities instead of, uh, yeah, a colonizer just taking knowledge and going away. Uh, and I, she gives interesting reflections on these. Uh, so that's just a tip. Um, yeah, what I wanted to finish with to also build a bridge to last week um, of what is the difference between maybe decolonization or anti-imperialism and diversity and inclusion. Uh, I think you've uh, all had to listen to the song Obama Nation um, um, today. And uh, in the song, you have uh, M1 from Dead Press, who also says like uh, white power with a black face when they rap about Obama or in the in the chorus, they say uh, Lambes, Lambok is a racist, Glenbeck is a racist, Gaza Strip was getting bombed, Obama didn't say shit. Um, basically huh? saying these quotes and this song is basically saying, okay, we have a black president, but if you look at his foreign policy, at the way he's interacting globally, he is still uh, uh, instituting basically imperialist and racist policy. Um, and in that sense, if you look at, at the, the readings you had to do uh, between understanding racism as an ideology and hey, racism is done by individuals, by wrong and evil leaders, or it is an institutional framework I need to understand. If you look at, at it from that way, uh, you can see that both uh, Trump and Obama will represent the White House, the white establishment, the white system, the white corporations and everything uh, in terms of uh, at least their foreign policy. Um, and yeah, I had to say a lot on this slide, but I think I'll keep it short. Maybe we can uh, save some for the discussions uh, of ne next week. Um, yeah, so this was just to connect it uh, to uh, to the readings of last week, do you look at racism as part of the infrastructure and institutions or just as a bad guy? Oh, Trump is Trump represents racism and Obama doesn't, or is it the institution that represent racist and imperialist foreign policies? Um, yeah, and another song. Yeah, I don't know. Today I feel felt like putting a lot of hip hop out there. I really love hip hop and I think always th these are also that's why I put it also on purpose. I think a lot of knowledge is produced in hip hop as well, uh, that are actually talking about the concepts we are talking about well or having critiques. And this one was, uh, it's part of his song. Uh, it's The Poverty of Philosophy by Immortal Technique. Um, and there he raps and says the following, for which I will finish. Uh, Most of my Latino and black people who are struggling to get food, clothes and shelter in the hood are so concerned with that that philosophizing about freedom and socialist democracy is usually, unfortunately, beyond their rationale. They don't realize that America can't exist without separating them from their identity. Because if we had some sense of who we really are, there's no way in hell we'd allow this country to push its genocidal consensus on our homelands. This ignorance exists, but it can be destroyed. People talk about change and working within the system to achieve that. The problem with always being a conformist is that when you're trying to change the system from within, it's not you who changes the system, it's the system that will eventually change you. There's usually nothing wrong with compromising a situation, but compromising yourself in a situation is another story completely. I want a better life for my family and for my children, but it doesn't have to be at the expense of millions of lives in my homeland. Um, so yeah, also here he says, we need this international solidarity for it to be truly for all the people. Uh, so I hope, uh, yeah, this gave you an idea between what is diversity inclusion and connect to the readings of last week. And um, yeah, hopefully uh, there was enough things uh, we can discuss that this lecture brought up. All right, peace.